We thank you, Lord God. And Father, I pray that from this point forward, Lord, that each of us in this body and in every body in this territory, that in, in this state and in this nation, that we would have a revelation, Lord God, of just what you did for us on the cross. We thank you, Holy Lord. We thank you, Lord. And may this be the day, Lord, that we fall so madly in love with you. So madly in love with you, Lord. That we would not question when, when you tell us to do something. And help us, Lord, to stand still until you tell us something new to do. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to share with you real quick. Last night I had a, a little smidgen of a dream, but I knew it was from the Lord. And in the dream, uh, I was walking down Main Street uh, from the south to the north, and every building was full with, some, with a business of some sort. Every building. So we need to pray for that, Lord. And we call in those businesses. We call in those righteous people from the north, the south, the east, and the west, Lord. Those that you have ordained for this city, we call them in in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, and by the way, when we came down Main Street this morning, first thing I saw, there's a name, some sort of a pet shop or something down there with pet food and treats and Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. <clears throat> All announcements on the overhead. Any uh, anything that's not on the overhead needs to be mentioned. Jerry. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody that came to help us work on the building yesterday. We made a lot of progress in front of the look like a building, mm -hmm. uh, inside and out. But we do have some lumber out there, and we ask that if you have a few minutes after the church, uh, that you help us clean inside so it doesn't get wet. Uh, not very much longer. It would take us maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So they come to help. Thank you. Anything else? Run here. Bless off for sure. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for each and every person here, Lord. I just ask that you be with us, Lord. And I do ask that you uh, bless this building as we work on it, Lord, and bring the people to work. Let us get it uh, finished in a timely manner, Lord, and let it, uh, once we do, that it's used for your purpose, Lord, to enrich, enrich your, uh, your kingdom, Lord. I ask now that you uh, bless this offering, bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Bring your tithes and offerings, and we'll have a few minutes of fellowship time. Yeah. Morning. How are you doing? Hey, how's retirement? Good so far. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. How are y'all? Ready? Good. Good to see you. Morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Morning. 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 Hey, Randy. Hey. How are you doing? Pretty good, I guess. It's good. I'll pop the grass. <laughs> oh, man. I started mowing yesterday. Uh, it's been too wet to mow. I got half of it done and just wore myself out. Usually she mows while I weed eat everything, but she was gone. I, th I told Donna yesterday, I mowed mine yesterday evening. I started cutting hay yesterday morning. And uh, I said, that's the fifth time I've already mowed. Really? Five times. Wow. I know four. You, and I think that's the fifth. Yeah. I've been well, mowing every week now. Mine was a foot high. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
All right. Malin. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We do thank you for the blood of Christ that has washed us clean and continues working in us, sharpening us, because you, Lord Jesus, said you would finish what you have started. And so we know that every day we are going to see you make adjustments in us, that you will use us to sharpen one another. And so, Lord, we pray for the body to truly understand uh, that you are here, that uh, we have the authority and the right to approach you with anything at any time because you have made us holy. You have made us righteous. And so we thank you for that because it is nothing we have done. It is only because of your love for us. So, Lord, we come this morning to return that love, to return our praise, that we would lift up your name above all others, that no matter what we are doing, we would do it as unto you. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and remove any distractions from us, that you would help us to truly embrace this word, that it would become a living word, not just a rote word. And so give us those ears that can hear and hearts that can understand in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Those are the uh, announcements, but I got another message from uh, Pastor Stephen in India. Uh, they had their, uh, they're on a different time schedule than us, their vacation Bible schools. So these are just some of the pictures that they sent. I can't remember. They must have had like 20 different ones going on in different parts of it. He also asked us to be praying because uh, persecution there in India is a lot more severe than what we are seeing. Didn't they have a pastor killed not too long ago? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not this one. That's quite a group. And they were in the cities, different places. And they have fellowship dinners too. So, Father, we lift up Pastor Stephen and his ministry and the people there. And, Lord, we know that what they are facing is more difficult than we are, that they are getting uh, resistance, not only from the government, from those who are rejecting your name. And so, Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around him, his family, and the ministry, and all those, Lord God, who seek you. We pray that you would provide the finances necessary, whatever way you can, that you would stretch the money, the food, that it would reach all those in need. And so, Father, we thank you for this partnership that we have that spans thousands of miles, but we know, Lord, that in you, distance is never a problem. And so, Father, we thank you for showing us that the body of Christ truly does include everyone. And so, Father, we thank you. And again, we just pray your blessings upon them in your most holy name. Amen. We're going to continue with uh, authority and responsibility. Today we're going to look at the three spheres of authority. Now I want to, we were talking on Sunday morning about we make our plans. Honestly, from one Sunday to the next, I really do not know where we're going. I have an idea. So after I finish this message, I do not know where we're going next Sunday, but the Lord will tell us. There is no way that we can cover any topic, much less this about authority and responsibility from this pulpit. So what the Lord says is I, he wants to give us enough that we will now seek it because this word is true, but we need to seek it on our own. So I encourage you to read the Bible, to look up the scriptures on authority, to do a study on it, to seek the Holy Spirit and say, what does this mean for me? Because every time I do this, I learn new stuff. And so there's no way to cover it all. I would make a mess out of it. But when we look at the Bible, the Lord has given us three spheres of authority. That is the family, it is the church, and it is the state. 
And we will look at those. And those three spheres of, us, of authority we cannot deny, though we often try it. Now, we said that he is also the beginning and the end. We know that. He is the author of all authority. So no matter where we are, no matter who we are, we are all answerable to him. And so I want to just kind of briefly look at these. But when you look at the family, this is the first sphere of authority God created on the face of the earth, and we know it. God created Adam, then Eve, and then what did he tell them? Go out and have children. That family unit is precious to God, and it is the building block for everything else that's happening. And so when we look at the family unit, we can see that in his plan, that family is responsible for the most important things that are going to lead to a culture that serves him. The family was responsible for procreation, having kids. But I also want to sidetrack to this, that now we are looking at ways of producing children in test tubes. We are genetically altering children so that you can actually pick what you want your child to be able to do and look like. And so what we see is now we have the state encroaching upon God's plan. He said the family is responsible for your health, not our government. It is responsible for providing for one another, for nurturing, education. And that's not talking about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's talking about education in general. But more importantly, the family is responsible for the spiritual education and instruction of all of the children. So when you look at the family unit, God will give the parents the authority. They are to teach that to the children. Those children go out and spread that authority, and it is the building block. So the family comes first. Now, I want to just ask you, if you paid any attention to the news over the last year, you will see that the family is under the greatest attack of anything else. Amen. Amen. Let's destroy it. Let's separate kids from parents. Let's do things in schools, but don't tell the parents. Let's make sure that if the parents don't abide by our social justice, we're going to go after them. Parents can be arrested if they don't give their children the health care that children are demanding. And so what we see is the enemy attacking the children. <clears throat> the second, oh, and this one, be fruitful, increase, and multiply. And then this one, in Deuteronomy. These, and I always like Deuteronomy because it's Moses' dying words. It's kind of a relationship. God says, okay, Moses, come up to the top of this mountain, deliver the last word. When you're done, you're finished, I'm taking you. And I'm going, well, that would kind of be a nice way to go. Anyway, he says, Hear, O Israel, and this is what we call the Shema. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your heart, all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down. And when you rise, Amen. the church is not responsible for raising your children. The church is here to equip families to teach the truth. But it now happens in the home is where the training actually goes. And the Lord says, whatever you're doing, let the children know that we're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ for him. No matter what you do, when you're taking a walk, talk about the Lord. When you're sitting at the table, talk about the Lord. It's not about throwing the Bible at them all the time. But it's just simply saying, look, we can see God's word at, at work. And that's why I love being outside. Nature is one of the ways God teaches me anything. It's absolutely amazing. I don't know about you, but Oklahoma is a really strange place to live. Because we have all kinds of blessings and we have all kinds of little problems too, like allergies and stuff. But we have wind. Have you ever watched the wind? And have you ever watched a hummingbird? Those things weigh nothing. And the wind will not blow them around, but it will blow my trash cans a half a block. And I got to go chase it. I'm watching this little thing. God says, what does that tell you? It tells us that if we are in Christ, no outside force can move us. Amen. And so he says, this is what I want you to do is I want you parents to not stuff the Bible down, but to actually bring in the Lord in a realistic way 
and talk about his commands and talk about why we do it. And if there's discipline, then this is why we're doing it. If I tell you no, this is why. That's the responsibility of parents. The church is here to help us, to enlighten us, to give us greater understanding. And then Ephesians. And of course, this one has a lot of uh, debate too. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. That is probably one of the words today that would bring the, the most discord because... For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and the two will become one flesh. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We could go through all of that. Wives, you submit to your husbands in everything. Husbands, that does not mean you order your wife around and tell her what you want for supper. And it doesn't mean you come in and sit down and say, I'm the breadwinner. I've worked so hard now. It's your turn to clean up and this and that. Now, husbands, we are to love our wives the same way Jesus Christ loves us. So have you ever had Jesus wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you to go put on some go cook him dinner or to clean up or go out and do this. He doesn't order us around. So the way the family works is a perfect example of the way Christ and the church are related. When we do that, the children then can see in a real way the relationship that we're to have with Christ because husbands, we submit to Jesus Christ the same way that the church does. Jesus gave himself. So wives, when you submit to your husband, you're actually submitting to Jesus Christ. It is a perfect relationship. It's not one of authority and force. The children then honor that. We teach them to honor parents because they're the parents. And when we do that, we then create a, a small image of the church. And that is what the enemy is after. Because when the world looks at a godly marriage, they should see Jesus Christ and the church. When they see children who obey and honor their parents, they see us as we are to respond to Jesus Christ. So what does the enemy want to do? He wants to disrupt the family so that it's a terrible image of the church, that people are splitting. Children don't honor their parents. They are going their own way. They're re rebelling left and right. Fathers are doing this. Wives are doing that. I can have more wives than I want. I can go do this. And people are going, that's the church? Well, in a way. So that's why the family is under such attack. It is why the Lord says, I have put so much emphasis in them. The second sphere is the church, his ecclesia. This is his governing body on the earth. It has given us the responsibility of doctrine. Now, for the most part, when we think of church and doctrine, we think of the doctrine of this denomination and this denomination. But doctrine literally means the word of God and how to apply it. We are not here to teach you or your children. We are here to explain the doctrine, talk about it, look at it, and then parents go home and teach that doctrine and how to obey. And so too often, and I was this way, I went to church for the pastor to tell me what I needed to know. And then whatever it was, when church was over, I'm done. I go home and I just live my life. Feed me is basically what I looked at the church as. You feed me what I need to know. We're here to help us explain together this doctrine. How do we apply these to our lives? What does it really mean to us to have the authority of Christ? Then, how to live that. How to apply what it really means. And we do it by example. So the church has a responsibility of doctrine. Not the state, which we will get to in a minute. 
It has the ability to, to show how to practice the word and how to govern. Now, this govern is a different govern than the way our people in Washington are governing us. How to govern is how do we govern this area, this place, in the name of Jesus Christ because He is our Lord. And He governs with love, grace, mercy, but with a strict hand that His word will never change you do not make adjustments to it, and you do not choose what you like and what you do not like. So we don't have favorites in here. To govern means that what we do is we apply His justice and His Word evenly to everyone all the time, and we govern not by uh, force, but we govern by His Word, by His love, by His grace. Amen. And He's given His a church the authority to fulfill His Word and to bring His kingdom to this earth. Now, here's the good thing, because we also submit to the civil authorities. But you and I have the authority to bring the kingdom of God from heaven to this earth. Amen. Amen. And not... <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that authority. But you know what's wrong? Most of us go... I don't know what that really means. I can't do it. I don't believe it. You can do it. And the church just goes. So God gives us this authority and we look at it and we go, now what do I do with it? And we usually don't do anything because we're going, what does this mean? He says, when we pray the, whole, the Lord's Prayer, we're not supposed to just repeat it, but He said, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven, which means that we can bring heaven to earth. Our obedience can be just the same way here as it would be in heaven. And we bring His kingdom. You have the ability, the authority to take the kingdom of God because he resides in you into any place here. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't take Jesus into the schools, that you can't take him into your workplace, that you can't take him into the stores, that you can't take him anyplace else because you can bring the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean we stand up and we say, in the name of Jesus, I call down the kingdom. You go in and you say, Lord, I have authority in this place and I ask you to be in the midst of it. I have authority to do that. That's right. I don't have the authority to go into the school and play, pray out loud, screaming Jesus' name, because that would not be right. But I do have the authority to walk down through that school, and I can pray over every locker, and I can say, Lord, bless this student in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let this school be ruled by Amen. your justice. Bring in godly people who are going to fear you and submit to you. Amen. We have that authority. Yes. We never do it by force. And so when you look at Matthew 16, 18, we've looked at this uh, before. He says, I tell you that you are Peter, you are the rock, and I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You and I have authority to repel darkness. Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. But how many of us watch TV and we go, gosh, that's so bad, that's so dark. I just never mind, just let them do it. He said, no, pray for it. When we see something going on here that we ain't, it, it's not what you like and don't like, but when we see something not right here, instead of complaining about it, please don't get on Facebook and tell everybody what's wrong. We take authority and we say, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that darkness away. We pray this is it. If there are people doing things you're not supposed to, let them be caught. Let them repent. If not, then clean them out and let's get godly people in here. Amen. We have the authority because the gates of hell cannot overcome the authority Christ has given us. 18 and 20, we've read that several times. We have all authority has been given to Jesus, and he's given us authority to go into this world, to take his word, to preach it, to baptize, to deliver, to heal, to do what Jesus himself did. And I can tell that every one of us is just feeling the power of the Spirit. And we're going, Turn just shut up and open those doors because I'm going to hit this town and they'll know Jesus is here. And we're all going. Up. Because for so long the church has taught us, yes, this is what Jesus said, but don't believe it. You don't have that authority. And the church has just become meek and timid. We don't go out screaming and yelling and holding up signs. We go out in love and grace, but in absolute confidence that we can walk the streets. We can pray over our home. We can declare it saved. We can declare it clean. Anytime Carol and I go anywhere and have to spend the night, as soon as we open our hotel door, 
We stop and we ask the Lord to cleanse that. And we invite the Holy Spirit in there and say, you come in here and abide this place. Be a place of peace for us. When we leave, we ask the Lord to remain there that whoever comes in will fill his presence. Why? We're paying for the room. We have authority. That's right. I don't even want to think of what goes on in some of those hotel rooms. So we pray that every single time. If you've not prayed over your home, pray over your home. You have authority. And he says, this is what I want. You have authority to do that. We do not have authority to disregard the laws of the land unless those laws interfere with the authority he's given us. And we'll get to that. And then Hebrews 13, 7, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those do this so that the, their work will be a joy, not a for that would be of no benefit to you. Okay, elders are here, submit to them. Why? Because they're smarter than you are. Because they're more bold, they're more knowledgeable. They're, no, because when the Lord says... And that's why when I told the class, you want to be a prophet? Get online. There's a place in there for $20. You can get a certificate that will say that you're ordained and you can actually marry people. And it will also certify that you are a prophet of God. You have no authority because authority doesn't come through the Internet. But when God, and I'm the perfect example, I have no degree. <laughs> I have no diploma. I have absolutely nothing that says I have reach the point of being qualified to be a, quote, pastor. But when God says, I call you to this place, I give you authority to fulfill it. So you submit to the authority of the elders because God gives them authority. But we do not have the authority to tell you how to live your life. We have the authority, though, in this place to guide, direct, so we submit to those above us. And this is the important thing. If I do something or the elders do something that you do not agree with, don't stew over it. What do you do? You have authority to come and hold us accountable and say, okay, what's going on? Why are we doing this? But the church has been taught that you never question this authority. You don't like it? Be quiet. God says, no, you do. And then we probably won't get through with this. Quit the state, your government, your civil authorities. Yes, the one we pray for every day. God has given them the privilege, the responsibility to protect, to provide economic order, to provide justice and the defense of this nation and us. They have no rights to determine what your freedoms are, they have no right to give you freedoms. They have no right to take them away from you. That's right. Our government, his government, his state was meant to protect everything else that God has given us. And so when we look at this, you can put any official, whether it's a school board member or whether it's somebody at city council all the way up to the president, those people are put in order and given authority. So we are to submit to them with our given authority but that submission must never cause us to disregard God. Amen. Amen. And I know that makes perfect sense because to me, I'm sitting there going, okay, Lord, you're going to have to do something with this. And this is probably the most well-read and most liked scripture now. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment to, on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. 
For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, if honor, then honor. And Peter says basically the same thing. I pay taxes. I do not like it. And I gripe every day. Penny, I'm sending them, but I send it to him because that's my responsibility. And if I don't, God will punish me, not the government for demanding more taxes. He will not do that. The civil authorities have authority over us in a civil sense. God has authority over us in a spiritual sense. So in the spiritual sense, we honor Jesus by honoring those authorities he has placed over us as long as those authorities do not try to take away our spiritual rights. Amen. And that's where we come into civil disobedience. Amen. And we don't try to find ways around it. And we can complain all we want about civil authorities, and it will do absolutely no good. It will not. It just makes you matter and matter and matter. What we do is we say, I don't care whether you agree with President Biden or not. I don't care if you like... Uh, uh, Trump or not, when he was elected president, God anointed him as president. The church had a responsibility to respect that office and pray for that man. And it's easy to pray for the president that we voted for and to ignore the one we did not. But if God says, I gave them authority, good or bad, right or wrong. Those people are there because I put them there. Church. You are to respect them, pray for them. We don't have to like them, but we have an authority to pray for them. So we have these three, and I'm not going to cut this short, but we're going to skip the middle. I'll bring that back maybe next time. You read that real quick. I do have these printed out, so if you want the middle of the message, uh, I have notes back there. You can go and get them. These three spheres of authority we see when Israel came out of uh, bondage. You have Moses is the civil authority. Aaron and the Levites are the spiritual authority. And then you have the families. Aaron and the Levites are responsible for every spiritual aspect of it. They performed the uh, sacrifices. They touched the holy items. They cleansed people. Moses never touch the holy object. His responsibility was to take God's word and dispense it and keep order. The family in those tents was to teach the children to obey God. Amen. Those are the three. They are not working separately. They all work together. Take a family who's committed to God, who does not submit to the church, and you're going to have a family that's going to have trouble raising godly children. You take a church that does not submit to Jesus Christ, and it's going to be a church that goes off on its own. But if we have a government who tells us, and it has, President Biden said schools, teachers have the authority to take children, elementary kids, and can take them and tell them about transgenderism, they can form clubs after school and bring kids into them and teach them all this stuff and give them books that I would not read in public or probably even in private. And they don't have to tell the parents. They can actually sign kids up for, if they're old enough, sex change operations in some state, and you cannot have to tell the parents. But President Biden this week reminded teachers that teachers, any school official, cannot, quote, encourage students to pray. I can do all this other stuff as a school employee, but I cannot go to a student and say, you know what, you got an issue, you should pray. That's breaking the law. I will tell you, I will not obey that law. Because you've got now a civil government that's telling me how I, 
and to speak God's word, which I am commissioned to do. And I will not walk through a place and see somebody hurting and not tell them that Jesus Christ is the answer. Amen. Amen. I will not point blank wear T-shirts that say Jesus Christ is the answer because that is against the authority of that school. So there are times when our government will try to limit what you and I are to do as Christ's followers. They have now labeled Christians, particularly if you're white, if you're male, and if you're Christian, you are the terrorist group to watch out for in this country. They have also declared in some places that if you speak the gospel, if you quote the scripture that says, this is a sin, point blank, you can be arrested for a hate speech. And, get, and we have said it before, Jack has said it before, you better decide now whether or not you're going to go to jail or whether you're going to listen to them. Because what we see now is instead of these three spheres working together, the enemy has so messed them up that we've got the state taking over the family. Because now the state is saying, we're going to raise them. We have schools saying, we're going to make them social citizens. We know what's right. We have the, our government telling us, if you don't do this, we're going to remove your children. We have the government trying to run the family. We have the government trying to limit the church. And so what we see is the government, our government, our civil authorities are trying to take God's place. And they are going to want to make this country after their image. Do you know what that's called? Idolatry. It is called old Israel. Read right. the book of Judges. You want to know what's going to happen to us? Read Judges. You want know Mason, 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 and I don't, I'm going off tangents, but I'll quit really in a minute. Read Judges. The people do what's right in God's eye. Some time goes by and then they go do whatever they want to do. And they God brings them under the condemnation of these nations. You know what's interesting? It goes, and the Philistines rule over Egypt and punish them in this and, and for 20 years. And then Israel cried out for help, and I'm going, why in the world would it take 20 years for you to say, you know what? Let's see God. But you want to know something? We haven't learned that lesson either. No. If the elections were held today, this country would reelect President Biden and all of his policies. And his policies are, he wants not just abortion, he wants you to be able to put to death children born alive. And so we're going, God, when are you going to come? And he said, I don't know, when are you going to really call for me? And we're going, well, I am. And he's going, no, you don't understand. This nation is still so divided. But when we cry out, God will come back. And so what we are seeing is that even the church has usurped her authority because some churches are telling families what they should and should not do. Right. Some churches are even telling people whom they should marry. Some churches are telling you this is how you should give. Some churches are saying, you know, we're going to look at the roles and we're going to see who's tithing. And if you're not tithing, we're going to come after you. We don't have authority to do that. I have authority to teach the gospel which says you should tithe, test him. I guarantee, I, I don't guarantee, he'll guarantee you will never lack if you tithe. That's right. That's right. And the Amen. church went Amen. silent. <laughs> but people say, oh, you don't talk about that because all you want is money. No. God wants it because the church runs on money. Speaking of which, you thought I was going to forget, didn't you, Johnny Joe? And I did. Until then, <laughs> we saw last week the uh, uh, slideshow on the uh, Cornerstone Kids that went to Urban Air. Johnny Joe said uh, that that cost for everything $1,200. They got $400 back. So we're going to take up a love offering for Cornerstone Kids. This is a love offering, not part of your ties. If you want to give to the children's ministry, because from what I understand, we're going to see more of these activities for them. They've got something planned for this summer, science experiments or something. 
that will be very interesting. So we're going to give into that. So while I close, anything that goes in here now will be for the kids. So now I'm going to jump to the end, but next week there's no time to go. So what does this mean? You and I need to know our authority. We really do. We need to really seek the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what is my authority as an individual, as a family? We need to know it so that you and I can go out and make a difference. But we also need to know it so that no one can take that authority from us. We need to know it so we don't abuse it. We need to know it so that the church can come back to the place where God said is that we are the head, we are not the tail. Amen. Amen. We have to refuse to give it up. We have to stand on the authority that Christ gave it. Every one of us needs to understand that when you open your mouth and speak His Word, God will put power into it because you got the authority to speak the truth and God's truth is never weak. It is alive and it is active. So it's not you and I that have the power. It is the Word that has the power, but you and I have authority to speak it. There are a lot of people that quote the Bible. They have no authority because they're not serving God. But when you and I stand up and speak, it will be powerful. Amen. That's your authority. We need to do it so that we use the authority in the right way, not to get even, not to get what we want, but to bring God's justice. And there's a whole other part of this because now when you break this all down, every individual has authority. Every one of us has a sphere of authority, a sphere of influence. Every one of us is individuals. So when you put us all together, we have authority over families. We have authority over this over Cornerstone. We have authority over this area. We have authority over this state. And it grows. Now, if that doesn't boggle your mind, then you don't need to pray about it and you don't need the Holy Spirit because that's why He gives it to us in pieces. You have been chosen. You have been sent out. You and I have been given that authority. We can pray for this community, every building, to be filled with a godly business. We have authority. Yes. You have authority to pray for this praise and worship team. Are you? And I'm not talking, and I do this. Lord, we need that praise and worship team instead of these videos. Praise Bingham, God said, Really? That's your prayer? 15 seconds? No, we need to call in the people who are going to be up here. We need to call in godly people to take these instruments. We need live praise and worship again because the videos are good, but I can't stop them and start them again, and we can't bring them up whenever we need to. Worship is alive and active. We need to have that return. So we need to take authority that the enemy has to stop hindering it, and we need to ask God, bring them in wherever they are, or Raise you guys up. Somebody out there has got some ability to get up here and let's bring praise back. We have authority to call in the finances for that building. And you want to know what? It's been happening. So after this, I think we need to go out and look at the building. I thank the people who do it. That building will be finished in the name of Jesus Christ. We have authority over diseases. We have authority over problems. We have authority over anxiety. But it's not a blank check that we just say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. In the name of Jesus, be gone. And we go, okay, no. Okay, I'll quit. I know you kept saying he said he was going to quit. Pray about it. Seek the Holy Spirit. Look in the Bible. Look up authority. And let the Lord speak to you. Father, we thank you. And we do, again, pray for Pastor Stephen and his protection. And we do, Lord God, call in those people who are going to be a part of this praise and worship. And we pray, Lord, that it would be done soon. That we can return with the musicians. That we can turn with the voices. That it can be led by your Holy Spirit where we can 
Make it a part of our worship. Make it a part of the message. Make it a part of this whole service. And Lord, we need you to bring in the right people, not people with the skill. We don't need just musicians. We need godly people who can play. So I pray if there's anyone here who can sing or play in any way, raise them up. Touch them and anoint them and say, you are my chosen. And we pray, Lord God, for that building. We thank you that we have made progress. We thank you for those who have come to give of their time. And we continue to pray that once we get to this point, bring in the finances for the next. That, Lord God, that building will be to your glory, not to ours. And so, Father, I pray over every person here that each one of us would understand our authority. I pray for every family that, Lord God, you would bless the father and the mother, that there would be peace in those families, that the children would not have any rebellious attitude, but they would understand that they will be blessed with long life and prosperity when they honor their parents, because that is what you have ordained for them. That, Lord God, we pray against any attempt of the enemy through the state or whatever to disrupt families, to tear them apart, to try, Lord God, to remove what you have established. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you in your most holy and wonderful name. Amen. God bless you.